remember last year, um, Commissioner Andrew McAllister here opening the panel and pointing out, we all, here we are, we're in a building. We all live in buildings. And in most of our lifetimes, that's traditionally been an energy consumer. But now, that game has changed. Sometimes it's an energy consumer. Sometimes it's an energy producer. Sometimes it is an energy balancer. Um, so it's a very exciting and fast-changing landscape. And to talk more about how this building sector fits into the 100% renewable energy future, we have Commissioner Andrew McAllister here and another stellar panel of experts, um, which will also include Byron Benton when we can find him. I saw him earlier today. Um, <laughs> Sorry to embarrass you, Byron. Um, and I will take it away, Andrew, and um, uh, and I will go live for Byron. All right, great. All right, yeah, please. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, Diane, and uh, and I want to just. Uh, it's great to be here again. Last year was really a lot of fun, and it uh, looks like so far this year it's uh, also a lot of fun. So thank you to David for the invitation and Diane, and. Um, the, the, you know, it seems every year there's, this is a great, a great gig. We have a great gig. <laughs> uh, you know, we get to sort of claim credit for a lot of things that, uh, that California does, which obviously all of you are, are making happen. So I appreciate, you know, you're, uh, you're giving us fodder for, uh, for, for visibility, I guess. Um, but it really is a team effort. And if there's one thing I learned in the Peace Corps, it's, um, it's you know, the, the best thing we can all do is do hard work, keep the pen, you know, get, facilitate, you know, really good work. Uh, produce solid you know, documents, research, uh, projects, whatever it is, but then give credit to everybody else. That's the essence of a team player. And that's really what California, uh, I think, has done. A lot of just people doing hard work, producing great results, and, and showing the world that it can be done. And, you know, it's not uh, something that, that, it's not hubris, you know? It's, it's not driven by hubris, it's driven by urgency, and it's driven by the fact that we really have to uh, achieve the goals that we've set out for ourselves because really the world depends on it. Um, so uh, I'm at the commission, uh, I'm lead on energy efficiency uh, and, and sort of all things buildings related. Um, and there, there, there is a, I think an on, uh, sort of an ongoing kind of increasing appreciation of the fact that buildings in a lot of ways is where the action is at. Uh, you know, I, I like to say buildings as a platform. You know, as Diane said, we're, we're in a building. Buildings, you know, they can have solar on the roof, batteries in the basement, EV charge in the parking lot, uh, demand response. They can be highly, highly efficient, reducing the kind of the, the challenge overall as a whole. And this, this is our, our template. This is our, our canvas, really, that uh, all of our efforts are focused, most of our efforts are focused on. You know, we have, we have generation, we have utility scale, we have sort of the traditional system outside of this building. But buildings really need to be like our, um, our, our batteries in, in a broad sense, right? We can do thermal storage, we can manage our load, we can uh, do a lot of things that uh, help the grid function in a reliable way that isn't just throwing a lot of money at technology, but rather it's smart management. Uh, so uh, we, we have now in 2018 a lot of tools that we didn't have even you know, five years ago, uh, certainly not 10 or 15 years ago. We can do a lot of analysis with big data. We can automate that. We can uh, you know, use it in policy development to do much more targeted, much more effective policy. But we can also do it in real time to manage our buildings. And there are business models that are doing that uh, incredibly well. And it's uh, uh, often not even, you know, it's not really, uh, not really well known that this is all happening. But there's an incredible amount of innovation going on right now at this moment. And I think uh, one thing that I, I constantly reflect on is, is what a unique moment we're all living in California here today, now. Um, there's, there's, we're gonna look back on this, this stretch of uh, a few years and we're gonna be like, wow, that was a lot going on and there was a lot of uh, innovation that was produced and it's really making the world a better place. Um, and it's about, uh, it's about uh, you know, a much broader se series of benefits, a much broader portfolio of benefits uh, than just what we tend to talk about in the energy sphere, right? It's air quality, it's indoor air quality, it's equity, housing, um, it, it's it, our economy, our economic growth. Um, you know, it's really about our prosperity generally. 
Uh, and so we're making that happen. We're kind of in the engine room doing that. I guess that's an outdated analog, but or, or metaphor. But uh, you know, we're, we're, I guess, what would we say? And how do we think about how we replace engine room in terms of uh, what's you know driving change? Um, so we are going to talk uh, in this panel um, about the building sector's role in uh, a 100% renewable system. Um, so we have a great set of speakers. Byron, how are you? Good. <laughs> Glad everybody's uh, here, and we just have we have a diverse panel in terms of perspectives on this uh, on this set of issues. And so I think as a as a group, they really encompass uh, you know what's going on in the building sector, um, and what's possible, kind of where we're going. Um, and I just want to you know I want to point out that, that we focused our policy. Um, for a long time on sort of buildings around this concept of zero net energy. And that's really not good enough anymore. Um, you know, doing an annual accounting of energy in, energy out does not mean carbon free. Okay, that, that, that middle of the day kilowatt hour is pretty clean and it's got actually a very low value right now uh, because there's a lot of it. That middle of the night kilowatt hour is actually pretty high carbon content. And so just exchanging those one for one doesn't work anymore because that doesn't get us to carbon free. So we have to start thinking more in temporal terms. We have to start thinking about um, you know, certainly heavy, heavy efficiency to just reduce uh, the, the load curve uh, overall, but also how to you know, shape, shift, shimmy the, 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 uh, the load shape generally and make sure that you know, every kilowatt hour that gets consumed uh, is, is as low carbon as possible. And that's, I think, our, our challenge of the day. It's a policy challenge. It's a, it's a, a bit of a technical challenge, although I'd, I would argue that the technical challenge is smaller than we might think. Um, but in terms of the, the, the goal that we're looking for in buildings, we really need to go towards an emissions metric. Uh, it's not just about sort of energy. It's really about the emissions content of each unit of energy. And so that's really what we need to focus on. And that does give a, a, a new sheen to uh, you know, how important the analytical environment is and the active management uh, needs of the grid going forward. So we're in California. We can do this. We have technology. We have uh, really smart people. We've got the sixth largest economy in the world. And uh, I think we're going to show that it can be done. Uh, we're going to work with other countries, you know, Germany, Mexico, uh, China. We have a lot of uh, agreements with other countries and other jurisdictions, obviously, across the world to, to carve off pieces of this problem and solve it. But uh, I really am optimistic that this is the place to be. And again, we're all really lucky to be part of it, I would argue. So uh, we, I will get on with our, our panel. Um, and we're going to go in order here. Um, and I'll just, uh, I'll, the bios are in the, in, the, in the book, so you can read those. Uh, but Byron Benton is training director of IBW uh, NECA Zero Net Energy Training Center. Fabulous facility. Uh, if they can manage the tours, I would, I would really commend everyone to go down there and check it out. It's uh, really admirable, and we'll hear about it. Um, beautiful uh, learning center. Uh, Brian Dove from Mutual Housing California. He's the director of asset management. Um, and uh, it's, uh, th they work in a sector, low-income multifamily, that, uh, that has historically been challenging, and they're just showing, uh, you know, to, to really make those investments and make uh, high-performing buildings, and they're showing that it absolutely can be done and done well. Uh, Todd Foley is the Senior Vice President of Strategy, Policy, and Government Relations at ACOR, the American Council on Renewable Energy. And finally, uh, Ramesh, um, Ramamurthy, who's uh, uh, the Endowed Chair in Energy Technologies at UC Berkeley and the Assistant Lab Director at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Uh, so I'm a, I'm an alum of both of those entities, so uh, I really have a, a passion for the research that goes on up in Building 90 up there. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll pass to our first panelist, uh, Byron. All right. You want to you stay there? Or? You can stay there. Uh, either way, so each person is uh, free to do what they want in terms of sit How's or stand. This is working? Okay. Well, good morning, early afternoon. Uh, nice to see you, Commissioner McAllister. I'm here on behalf of IBW NECA. So our vision and goal was to create the optimum learning environment. And along the way, the idea of net zero, which turned into zero net, came up. It was a 1981 46,000 square foot building that was renovated to achieve zero net status. We have now, we are now completing our fifth year. We have maintained our zero net status since inception. And for us, I've heard it more than once now, 
The key really is energy efficiency. We have to make our buildings as energy efficient as we can to begin with, so that was our approach. And the wonderful thing is by having a highly energy efficient building and then following it up with renewables with solar and wind, you not only create a zero net building, which is good as we know for the environment, it's the training that takes place there, because these systems, especially these energy efficiency systems, historically the concern was, well, they sound great, the technology appears to work, <clears throat> but they're not user friendly. And then eventually over time, people stop using them. Well, that's the work that we do. That's what IBW NECA does. We install those systems and we have to make sure they're installed right the first time. So here we are in year five. We're still zero net. We just got our final measurement verification report. They project us to continue to be zero net indefinitely into the future. So once we take that approach, here was the other piece of it. This is a complete win-win when we're talking about buildings. Again, optimum learning environment. We're sitting at a college right now. These high performance buildings that are zero net are actually so healthy and user friendly right here in Berkeley at the National Lab. A study shows that when you are in a room where you can look outside and connect with your outside environment like we can today with these windows, all of our classrooms have that. All zero net high performance buildings are built this way. It's like taking a psychological breath of fresh air. It raises the energy level and allows the individual to focus, and it's been shown to increase work and academic performance. And the other component of a zero net building is a natural ventilation component. Of course you have air, air conditioning and heating, people need to be comfortable, but when you actually have windows that open and let the natural ventilation be a part of your heating and cooling system, it's a healthier building and people don't get sick as much. So we're really excited. I'm gonna see Andrew next week. We're gonna be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for the Getting to Zero conference. And just, this is real. We're having more and more people. I know we talked about a tour. It's crazy what happens with our, what's happened. It's gone beyond. Everybody said, oh, we'll have two waves of interest. We're like on wave four. Wave one. The novelty, huh, I didn't know you could do that. I didn't know you could convert a 1981 building and get it to zero net. Wave two, well you did it, you got the data to prove it, how'd you do it? Wave three, how are you sustaining it? What are the degradation factors of the solar panels and the inverters? Wave four, we wanna do the same thing. We've had French Polynesia recently come. They're talking about floating islands. They've spoken before the United Nations. They came to our building to say, we need to do renewable, sustainable floating islands in the Pacific. Next week, we have Australia coming, a large electrical contractor consortium. They want to do something similar in Australia, but really it all started here in California. And like Andrew, I'm, I'm pretty proud to say that I'm from the Bay Area. So thank you so much. I am Brian Dove with Mutual Housing California. So we're a nonprofit affordable housing owner and developer based in Sacramento. Have about 1,100 units, house about 3,300 individuals across uh, 18 apartment communities in Sacramento and Yolo County. Uh, so we serve, our average household income is about $30,000 per year. So this is a segment of the population that typically gets overlooked uh, for energy efficiency and sustainable, sustainability measures. Uh, when we were founded almost 30 years ago, we put in our bylaws that half of our board of directors is, uh, will be made up of our residents. So they're living and breathing in our communities, and they're, they're really pushing us to... Uh, to fulfill our mission of uh, designing and operating sustainable housing. So s some of the sustainability initiatives that we include in our, in our communities are uh, community gardens. Uh, our new construction and rehab projects are typically uh, meet LEED or Build It Green uh, designations. Uh, that picture in the, 
upper right, we, we got a grant through the California Air Resources Board through in partnership with Zipcar and the local air quality district to install electric vehicles at one of our sites. So the residents have an opportunity to check out a Zipcar for free, free use. And uh, this woman here is saying, I'm t I taking it to the grocery store, go grocery shopping. So we just got that grant expanded to expand to two more, two more of our sites. Uh, and then we also have a large leadership development component. So our residents are getting leadership skills and we have a, a staff of community organizers that help, uh, help with the initiatives that are important to the residents. You know, our marquee, one of our marquee developments is mutual housing at Spring Lake. So this opened about three years ago. It's in Woodland, about uh, 70 miles northeast of here. It's uh, designed to be zero net energy. And when we were doing outreach with the local population, we, um, we asked them what's important for housing. Uh, housing cost was number one, of course, but uh, utility expenses were number two. And we kept hearing that over and over again. So we decided to, to design and build this community as a zero net energy community. And our definition here was we want to go all electric and we design, uh, designed it as efficient, efficiently as possible and then added the, the solar to offset the annual, expected annual consumption. It's a, uh, it's a 62 units. It's uh, for permanent farm worker housing. And so these are some of the energy efficiency features we added to it. It's, uh, Energy Star appliances, heat pump, water heater, and HVAC system, tight building envelope, the um, thermostatic shower valves. So apparently there's people in the world, and maybe in this room, that turn on the shower in the morning and then run around the house and do other things when the water heats up. <laughs> Anyone want to admit that? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so these, these uh, uh, shower heads that are cheap, $50, they can't, they'll shut the water off when it heats up. And so we don't have to change behaviors. So then when the resident is ready to get back in the shower, they just go and pull the cord and the hot water flows. So this saves water, but also the electricity needed to, to heat that water. We also have these energy monitors that one side uh, illuminates, um, showing how much electricity is being used at any one moment. And then the other side is how much electricity is being used throughout the day. So if at the end of the day it's red and purple, uh, we've educated the residents to know, okay, that's more than we expected, that's an excessive amount. And these are, studies have been shown that these, these reduce electricity usage by three, three to five percent. So we could uh, lower our solar panel system size by three to five percent just because of that, that feature there. Next one. So how are we doing? Zero net energy performance. So we haven't quite met ZE and e the first three years. This, this graph, each line represents each unit. So one, each bar is one of the 62 units. So that dozen or so on, the, on this side, uh, they, they consume less electricity than they received in the solar credits. The big group in the middle, they're paying about 20 or 30 bucks a month on average for their electric bill, but that's also their utility bill. So they're not paying gas, they're not paying water, sewer trash. So, they're, so that's pretty good in our eyes. And then that group on the end is using a ridiculous amount of, ele of electricity. And one of the things we learned is, yeah, we can build it, we put in the most energy efficient features at the time, but we have residents, there's people living here. And so <laughs> they all use electricity differently. So then this next slide, you know, we go in and talk to some of these residents and one unit had these coolers you would find at a convenience store out on the back south facing patio. Uh, you know, we put in energy star appliances. S some like to have extra refrigerators and freezers. This TV with all the, these gadgets, that I don't even know what, there's four speakers and four devices of some sort. So d plug loads is, is a big thing that we, we don't know, we can't predict. And then, uh, of course, so there's medical needs. And so there's a household with an electric wheelchair so that they do get lower rates for that, but the uh, electricity usage is still higher than, than uh, typical. Oh yeah, Woodland gets very hot. And so if you visit this family and you open it up, half of it's cool, half, you can cool it or freeze it on the other half. And so you'll be cool, you'll be refreshed, but, he uses quite a bit of electricity. Uh, 
this next one. So yeah, so two of the lessons, one being, you know, these are residents that live here. These, we can't control, we can build what we can build, but there are, there's the human factor to it. And then as a building owner or operator, it's not enough just to build it, but we have to operate and maintain it and pay attention. And so uh, cleaning the solar panels is, is one thing. Uh, paying attention to the utility usage, hearing from the residents, educating the residents. So we actually have some youth or teens at the, at the site that are interested in this. And so, so They've learned about the systems, and now they're teaching their neighbors and peers at the site. And then these, these little power strips that we've handed out, that would typically go behind a TV like that with all the gadgets. And so instead of having to reach back there and turn it off, these, there's plugs you can put on the wall. As you leave for the day, you can just shut it off. And so I'll wrap it up there, but we do offer tours as well. And uh, we released a white paper on mutual housing at Spring Lake, and it's available on our website. And um, we, are, we actually just broke ground this week on phase two of mutual housing at Spring Lake, which will be uh, positive net energy. Is this working? Uh, hello, everybody. Todd Foley with ACOR. Uh, it's great to be out here. Um, I'm in Washington, but it's always fun to come to California to see some old friends. I've been involved in uh, the, uh, the market development out here for many, many years. I was with BP prior to being with ACOR, and, and I, of course, I remember going to the CEC 20 years ago now, Jan, uh, looking at uh, establishing the first uh, you know, incentives uh, for, uh, for development here. I've come a long way. I'm, I'm, every time I come out here, I'm reminded of that. Um, our mission at ACOR is to accelerate uh, the transition to a renewable energy economy, and of course, uh, buildings uh, factor huge in, in uh, that, uh, that, uh, that approach in go going forward. Um, according to EIA, uh, buildings uh, are responsible for about 40% of total U.S. energy consumption. Buildings surpass all other sectors of our economy, including industrials, as well as uh, transportation. So. Any kind of path to a renewable energy uh, 100 future, um, uh, even deep deca decarbonization, uh, must include buildings. So, uh, it's, of course, it's always an important subject. Um, I'm, always, I'm, of course, reminded that uh, uh, there's been already a lot of great uh, work done, a lot of success. In uh, California, you can see it uh, mo in, a mo in the most pronounced way. Uh, and of course, it starts with energy efficiency, uh, and there's been a huge set of progress out here, especially, uh, but also elsewhere. Uh, but uh, we still just have touched the surface on uh, the use of renewable energy in the, uh, the building envelope. Uh, we, of course, we see a lot of homes and businesses here in California, and that's notable. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, it, the rest of the country needs a, to do a lot more to catch up on that front. I'm reminded that, and uh, you know, I worked on the early Walmart stores, uh, Whole Foods, uh, Home Depot when I was at BP uh, 15 years ago. Uh, you know, Walmart has done a ton. Uh, they lead uh, the, the pace in terms of corporate use of, uh, of, re of uh, especially uh, on-site uh, solar rooftops. Uh, but uh, is, they've done about 145 megawatts now, hundreds of stores. But it's only, uh, solar is really only produce, producing power in about 7% of their facilities. So just an indication, indication of, of that we've got a long, long, much farther to go. I'd also note that uh, um, NREL did an interesting study a couple of years ago. They looked at the, uh, the solar uh, uh, PV rooftop technical potential in the United States. They did an analysis of all the existing rooftops. Uh, they noted that uh, thir if 30, uh, that the rooftop space with solar, technically, not necessarily economically or even fully practically, could produce about 39% of the nation's power. And that's just from, you know, rooftops alone. In California, the, the potential there is 74%. So as much as solar generation is happening here on, on the rooftop space, homes and businesses still can do a lot more. Now, that, of course, that's technical potential that's not fully economic necessarily in every instance. Um, and there's a lot more that can be done um, on to advance renewable energy. And I would just note that while corporates are doing more and more renewable energy, we're seeing homeowners invest uh, in the, that building context. Uh, as, as we're also noting here, if we're really going to get to 100 percent renewable energy generation, we have to look at it as a whole system. And, uh, and buildings are a part of that structure. 
Not the only part Andrew mentioned as we started here that yes, you have the duct curb here, you have high value uh, generation uh, from rooftop solar, uh, but, uh, but what about the, the rest of the, the 24 hour cycle each day? And I think that's what we need to look at going forward if we want to get to 100% renewable energy. Yes, solar works in the building context, as does you know, heat pumps and, and some other technologies, including wind. Uh, and, and a lot of the, the buildings are incorporating uh, wind, you know, not on site, but off site. And that's important, and that's part of the mix. But as we think about uh, a broader 100% uh, renewable energy generation, we've got to think broader in terms of the system. When I think of uh, what's, what we need to do to do that, um, I'm reminded of, of the, the efforts the last few years here to you know, create a West, uh, enhance the integration of the Western grid uh, so that, uh, you know, I would just note that the broader balancing areas, a more flexible grid, uh, and the, the deployment of advanced technology to have bi-directional uh, communications do enhance the, the, the ability to, ju to generate more and more renewable energy. And so these are all important developments. I know there's, there's some legislation moving here in the legislature on that to promote more interoperability in the, the Western grid. I think that's good. The notion here is you can generate solar power, obviously, during the day, whether it's a rooftop space here in California or even some of the deserts, California, Nevada, my home state of Nevada. But also uh, balance that with the use of uh, uh, Western, uh, you know, Oregon, Washington Hydro, even Wyoming Wind. And so therefore we can actually see a future where we get to 100% renewable energy generation and do it economically, and do it reliably, uh, and that's very important. I would just note that if you look at uh, elsewhere around the country, especially like in the Midwest, uh, they're, they're accustomed to, you know, uh, incorporating huge amounts of uh, renewable energy, mostly wind, almost exclusively wind. Uh, but the MISO, the Midwestern system operator, you know, they, they've got, uh, uh, you know, a ton of wind there. Uh, gener wind generation in Iowa is about 36 percent, something like that, right, Jonathan? Uh, Kansas, 29 uh, percent, Texas, and so on. But they're moving the power of the electrons around, and, and that's enabling them to do more and more renewable energy. So I think as we uh, uh, look to moving to 100 percent renewable energy generation, uh, we need to think about the building context very importantly, optimize that opportunity, but look at some of these other measures too as part of this system. I'll stop there and I look forward to you know, more discussion here. Okay, so um, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about two things and hopefully we'll have a discussion. Uh, let me start by asking you guys a question. Anybody has not heard of the notion Sunshot Initiative? Okay, not bad, 99% of the people here, awesome, that's great. Um, so I wanna tell you a little bit about Sunshot. It's absolutely relevant to what Diane, Diane and company are, are doing. So kudos to you guys to think about 100%. Let me take you back to 2010, not very far off. It looks like it was a different generation, perhaps it is. Uh, I was the founding director of Sunshot. It was two amazing years of my life. Uh, so much so that my kids were small kids here. They were living in California. I lived like a graduate student in, in, in D.C. And every time I came back, I came back uh, uh, once a month, and I would talk about, we did this, we did that. My twins got very angry with me. They said, you're always talking about your sunshot people. Maybe you should give us up for adoption, you know. And I said, <laughs> I said, so I went to Steve Chu and said, I gotta go back home. But it was a blast. It was an amazing experience. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it and say why this is important. So what was sunshot? If you look back to 2010, solar was selling at 27 cents a kilowatt hour, okay? and. Uh, the Steve Chu and the Obama administration wanted to do something really forceful. Uh, and so we will, I'll give you a quick description of that. So the, the, the question that Steve and Arun and myself were all asking is, what is it that the government can do to dramatically change the landscape? Okay. That's something that I would like you to take away. It was perhaps uh, one of the few occasions where the federal government was setting a standard. I want to now take you back to 7th of January, literally three days after we started Sunshot. We had an intense meeting in Steve's office, and for those of you who know Steve Chu, he will argue for everything, okay? And so we had this big battle in his office for three hours. At that time, people from the renewables industry, the manufacturers, they were telling Steve, this was the stupidest idea. 
And he said, you guys from California are inhaling something. You know? He said, we have no idea what we're inhaling. But, um, but so Steve was pushing us to be more conservative. He was saying, maybe we should not be pushing it this hard. We should be asking for 8 to 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And I was a rabid person in the room. I'm a physicist. I said, hey, the role of the government should be to stimulate this whole field. And I said, we need to go to 2 to 3 cents a kilowatt hour. At the end of the battle, basically, we, we had a truce. We said it'll be five cents a kilowatt hour. The good thing about SunShot was it had two targets. It had a time target, end of the decade, 2020, and you had to get from 27 cents to five cents a kilowatt hour. A 5x compression in the cost of some technology. And that you cannot do. You basically need a Harry Potter magic wand. You cannot do just by tweaking the knobs. Okay. And today you guys know better than myself where it is. We're almost there. And therefore, about two years ago, we went back and recalibrated the expectations for SunChart. It's now three cents a kilowatt hour by 2030. Okay. So the first message is that perhaps we need to have the audacity to dream about something which is very difficult without looking for Tom Cruise or Mission Impossible. That we, thank you. Yeah. And I think Diane and company, this is great that you guys are thinking about 100% renewables because in 2010, it was thought to be a crazy notion. Okay, many things happened in the in between. Uh, our friends in China helped us quite a bit in terms of manufacturing and stuff, all good. Okay, so, um, so by definition, it's a $300 million program. We covered the entire waterfront. Perhaps the biggest thing that we did, of course, as a federal government, we said, we're gonna set a target very high. See if you can reach it. It's never been done like that by the federal government. Typically, it gives you research money, you do whatever you want. In this case, the government will say, we're going to measure what you do. Okay. We funded a whole bunch of activities. Perhaps the biggest focus was the soft cost component, which not many people paid, paid attention to. So that was the second aspect of it. And you can see, this is basically telling you data from DOE that we're almost there. At utility scale, we're basically there at SunShot targets. The one thing that was very clear to me in March of 2011 is that when SunShot hit the five cents a kilowatt hour, we're going to see a lot of deployment, as you're seeing already. The thing that I was pushing for, and which I'm now kicking myself, is it was very clear it will not work simply by putting more solar panels on the rooftops or in, in utility scale. We needed the other two components, which is the last part of my, my spiel. Uh, we needed storage. And we did a, quite a bit of analysis. That storage is not the lithium ion battery that you see in your uh, Prius or the Tesla, because the cost structure does not add up. And so we said we needed energy storage at about $50 a kilowatt hour of installed cost, maybe one and a half to two cents of levelized cost. That's a very tough problem. That's a five to seven X reduction in the cost of energy storage if you were looking at batteries. And therefore, I say California, this is another opportunity for us to grab the bulls by the horns and go for the storage game plan. Our friends in China are going gangbusters after this animal. When you get to storage at five cents or $50 a kilowatt hour or two cents levelized cost, this game is going to be amazingly different, amazingly different. Okay, so uh, I already spoke about this, a grand challenge, I think, for the entire community, not just the science folks like us, but the entire community, the investment community, federal agencies, state agencies, everybody, I think we need to focus on this. I want to say just two words about what we did. When I came back to Berkeley, I felt a lot more educated because of the SunChart experience. And so what we did was to completely recast the organization that Art Rosenfeld, and this you need a lot of guts because this man is a genius, was a genius. So we said, hey, it is very important to look at the energy consumption in buildings. But you have to do more than that. You have to take a much broader picture. My colleagues have talked about this. We have to take the system of system picture. So we took our organization and said, these are the five things that we will work on. The first one is very obvious. It says building and urban systems. But instead of looking at one HVAC system, one refrigerator, we said we need to start to take a macro systems approach you need to start making the buildings talk to each other, exchange energy, exchange thermal energy. 
And again, like Sunchart, we have targets for them. And that's the other thing that I would like to impress upon all of you, that you need to be able to measure the impact. So we said, how do you reduce energy consumption in buildings by 50%? Of course, about the same time, CEC in the state of California came out as essentially the same language. Our second one is sustainable transportation. How do you reduce CO2 emissions by, we said 50%, you guys are now talking about 100%, which is fantastic. Our third one was basically looking at Sunchard. We said, what happens to the grid when you have 100% of renewables in a distributed fashion? That grid does not look like the Edisonian grid. So Edisonian grid is not a thermodynamic grid. You can do whatever you want with that. So that grid is going to look different. The other two have, have to do with manufacturing, which I obsess about. This nation needs to manufacture a lot, lot more than it does. And, and the last one is, is, has to do with the connection between water and energy. I will leave you with this slide. This is a facility that your tax money paid for. DOE built this facility called the Flex Lab. It is a place where you can look at the confluence of various parts of the energy ecosystem. It's a building built to understand energy efficiency. Marianne Piet, one of my colleagues, by far the pioneer, she worked for Art Rosenfeld, pioneer in demand response. We have those capabilities in these buildings. We have, courtesy of CEC, who have been fantastic partners for us, we have solar panels now. We have Tesla batteries. So you can actually start to do macro scale experiments, get data, analyze the data, and figure out what it means at the scale of a few small buildings. I encourage all of you to come and take a look, come and work with us, and start to push this notion of how do you get to 100% renewables. Thank you, Andrew. So great, and uh, I second that on the Flex Lab. It's a, it, it's, it, it's a, they have a building that rotates, and you can accelerate, you know, data collection and, and do all sorts of really amazing things. And uh, and uh, I'm hoping they put a restaurant in there at some point. It'll the views will be great. Uh, maybe there's a commercial kitchen. There's a commercial kitchen, you know, exper uh, test to do done there. I'm sure. Um, so I, I have a, a few questions. I'm gonna let's let's try to rattle them off pretty quickly, so we have some time for audience questions as well. Um, but uh, first, I want to ask Brian. You know, just uh, you know, your point of the people-centered uh, approach, I think, is something that often you know we talk we talk around that quite a bit. But in, at the end of the day, you know, we have to start where people are, and most people don't know and don't want to know about energy. And we, I don't you know I don't think we should, add, we should expect them to get you know hugely educated about energy. Um, and I guess I, I wanted to ask just sort of along those lines, you know, what are the biggest, you talked about some of the sort of the big user issues and all that. Um, you know, in doing a project like this, um, you know, in terms of interfacing with the local government, in terms of figuring out what the design elements are, you know, what are those kind of the biggest uh, barriers or challenges that you faced uh, in sort of getting, uh, you know, getting each step done in a way that allows you to make the project a success and doesn't, you know, eat up all your resources? There's a lot in that question. <laughs> um, I mean, it, there's, yeah, designing the project as efficiently as possible is, is very important, but there, we also can't make it too complicated that a resident can't understand it. Uh, the HVAC systems, we got a lot of complaints with the AC systems. They're heat pump air conditioners, which work methodically and slowly, and you should leave them on all day. And these residents aren't used, to, weren't used to that, so it's new. Um, yeah, the other point about some residents don't care. <laughs> we've, you know, we've, we've, we have, uh, we try to set up individual meetings with residents if they were interested, and then group meetings with residents to talk about energy efficiency, how to read their bills, how to read the PG&E true up statements. I don't know if any of you have seen it. They're 12 pages of. <laughs> code. <laughs> and if you're not an English speaker, reader, it's like, what is this all about? Um, so yeah, that, that's very important. And we also try to look at sort of passive, passive um, efficiency measures like the thermostatic valves. So they don't have to, to change behavior, but they do save energy. And then the more active are the, the energy monitors. Um, ceiling fans, the, you know, the power strips that, the power strips are, you would change behavior, but we try to make it as easy as possible. And that was an after the fact, after we built it, we saw that plug loads were really high, much more than we expected. And so that was something cheap and easy that we could hand out to residents. 
to uh, to use if they wish. Did, did you, uh, were there any issues with the building department and kind of educating them on the project and getting them through it? Um, yeah, I wasn't involved in the front end there, so, but I, I, I'm sure there, wa there was, but uh, with the codes today being so, so much more advanced, I think it's, big, it's getting a lot easier. Great. All right, thanks a lot. Um, one, it occurs to me one of the issues that we really, we, and CEC does not have jurisdiction over this, but the water, you know, you mentioned how many people turn on their shower and then walk around the house. Well, uh, you know, water system design is actually one of the issues that we need to work through. Like, you need compact water designs, you need a lot few, less resident water in the system so that the hot water can get where it's going. Uh, or, or, you know, end, use, or end of line circulation pumps and things like that uh, to get the hot water where it needs to go without waste. Um, let's see. So. Uh, I wanted to ask Todd, so um, you, know, you made a lot of great points about the, just the scale that we can get to um, if we cover rooftops and, and you know, look for all the opportunities to try to realize those. I guess I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how to get to our existing building stock, not just with solar, but just with, um, so definitely you know, obviously with solar, but also at the same time or in an integrated way, I think preferably uh, do uh, cost effective energy efficiency and, and sort of take advantages, particularly in low income space, of getting resources to those projects at the opportune moments so that we can actually have leverage to, to get deep savings and, and sort of deep improvements in performance of those buildings. I'm wondering if you uh, have, have thought about that sort of integrated approach. Sure. Uh, well, you know, when you, when you look at, uh, you know, the, that NREL study for when they, for instance, when they looked at the uh, the rooftop potential, they really are talking about existing uh, structures. I mean, that's, you know, we, we, we typically build buildings for to last 30 plus years, so there's a really slow turnover in, in that, that building stock that we have to, you know, take, take uh, into account here. So most of the work really is uh, on in the existing, uh, you know, uh, building stock. So it obviously does start with energy efficiency. Uh, uh, that's where you get the, the cheapest, uh, I think, reduction in use and, and, and cost efficiencies. Um, and, and it does make sense from an economic standpoint to uh, you know, reduce the amount of energy used and then, then to offset that with uh, renewable energy generation, whether it's solar or uh, even a, a heat pump or, or, or uh, you know, uh, purchasing wind uh, generated elsewhere. So it does, I think, start with that. I think. Uh, um, I, I think, like with a lot of things, uh, there's a, there are a lot of headwinds in this because, you know, historically when you know this building stock was put up, you know, we didn't have these considerations. And I think it's very different in California. These issues have been front and center for a long time now, but still, uh, still at the early the front end of that, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. I, you know, I, you know, from Washington here, uh, uh, you know, and. Um, you know, we still got a ton of uh, education. We got a lot of headwinds uh, from the national policy front uh, with the administration. Uh, Congress needs to still be educated in a lot of these things. Uh, but despite that, you know, you still have a lot of progress in the industry. Uh, in fact, uh, you, you know, we're seeing the market get way ahead, you know, of the, of the policy on that front. So, and I think that, comp you know, companies and projects like what, you know, we saw here, I think are good examples of all of that. So you know, I mean, this has been out there for a while, but it's it's still uh, it's still in many respects early. Great. All right. Um, let's see. I want to. Uh, so this is sort of a, a question for both uh, Ramesh and Byron. Um, you know, this temporal aspect of uh, consumption, sort of grid flexibility, that we really need to integrate renewables and and keep our buildings operating um, effectively and satisfying the occupants of them. I really, I want to ask about two aspects of that. You know, one, Ramesh, is the technical and policy. You know, you mentioned Mary Ann Piet and the, the, the DR study, you know, they did as I think the new standard, really, in terms of thinking about this issue. Um, and, uh, uh, but there are, you know, there continue to be barriers to getting demand response uh, really done at scale. Um, and so I wanted to sort of just get your thoughts about, uh, you know, how, to, how, do we, how do we really make that happen in terms of, uh, you know, whatever components we need. So, you know, it's rates, it's, uh, it, there are a lot of pieces of that, right? And so, um, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts on the sort of the technology and policy side of that. And then Byron, uh, workforce, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not just about installing widgets anymore, it's really about systems. And so I wanted to sort of get your view of sort of the train, you, you describe the, the, the center and it's so impressive and I think maybe a little more detail of, um, 
you know, the fact that you do have storage on site, you do have a lot of technology that's enabling all this to, to take place um, on in the facility behind the meter in a way that really just re can reduce the visibility of that building. Uh, so the workforce aspect of demand response, I think, is really key as well, like how to get these systems in place and tuned up. And, and maybe you could paint a picture of how that's happening and, and may maybe it'll happen in the future. So maybe Ramesh and then, and then okay. Barry. All right, so uh, I'm glad you brought this question up, Andrew, because it's something that I had I didn't cover in my, my, uh, my overture. Um, the first thing is uh, when we set up SunChart again, one of the things that we were debating back and forth was how do you posture this? And our conclusion was that when we brought the cost of the solar technology down to parity, deployment will happen automatically. In some sense, Steve was telling us, I don't want you to use policy as an instrument. I want you to use the tools of science and technology. We said, fine. So translating, and I bought into that completely, and I, I'm a big tech junk. Okay, uh, this, is, this is pretty obvious engineering faculty member <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and so um, I think this business of of what Andrew was talking about is at core a controlled systems problem. So if you go to FlexLab, we now have the ability where we have an operating system and we need to get into the way that our computing guys do. You need to have an operating system which orchestrates the energy input output of the building with time resolution. So you have demand response as a protocol, which is turning switches on and off, et cetera. You have variable renewable energy coming in uh, from solar panels, for example, and you have a battery. X plus Y plus Z has got to be a flatliner. So indeed, we call our program the flatliner program. How do you get to a flatliner? And therefore, I argue that it's a controlled systems problem. The second part of it has to do with parity. The customer will not pay a penny more, and they shouldn't pay a penny more. And therefore, it is really important to bring the cost down to a parity where the customer doesn't know the difference whether it's coming from a nuclear power plant, a coal-fired plant out somewhere, or from the rooftop. And so I think, I think there's a huge role, there's still a lot of room uh, in terms of the cost structure that we can bring them down to. But the solar panels, we think they can go down to easily 30 cents a watt. It's still 70, 80 cents. So it's got a lot of room for, for compression. Did that answer your question, Andrew? Well, I, I guess, um, I mean, partially, I wanted to kind of hear, uh, so the solar is generating during the day, right? And yeah. then sort of what are we doing, you know, what needs to be done in terms of sort of taking advantage of that you know, right. the, the most obvious thing is electrical storage, right. but I think there are a lot of ways we can do load management and layer in other renewables right. and all that, and right. I kind of wanted to hear sort of your right. direction. Yeah, so I'm glad you, you brought up that issue. Uh, clearly, I mean, in places like California, you can have so much of generation. The one thing that we in the lab are doing, and this is mainly the science side of the lab, is can you convert it to usable fuel? So we have a big DOE-funded program called the Photon to Fuel Program, where if you can do the catalysis efficiently, you can convert carbon dioxide. You do two things at the same time. You take out CO2 from the atmosphere, hopefully it's good, and you convert it to usable fuel. So CO2 to methanol is a very tough problem. And can you use the photons from the sun, all the excess photons that you get because you're generating so much electricity, and convert it into usable fuel? So that's clearly one path where you can do hydrogen generation the same way. Electrolysis can be stimulated by, by excess photons. So, and clearly, the, the more the cost of solar comes down, more all of these things can, can start to become value adds. Right, great. Great, thanks. Um, so, Byron, uh, workforce, if you can, uh, hopefully I didn't ask, a, uh, hopefully it's a, uh, not, too, not too difficult, you know, it's not, not a softball either, but uh, uh, I think you know, the, getting this done in the real world uh, takes uh, a lot of people on the ground doing stuff, and so, you know, if you could sort of give us a little bit of a feel for how that happens in your shop. Well, with the title of t training director, I better be able to speak to that. <laughs> um, when I got hired 16 years ago, the first thing that happened is they sent me back to Washington, D.C. for a new training director conference. While I was there, two things happened. To this day, has stayed with me. It will always stay with me. So we saw a PowerPoint presentation 16 years ago. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had identified 600,000 existing commercial buildings in this country that needed energy efficiency systems installed. The next day, the national director said, Byron, 
If you don't train on it, you're not even in the conversation. So from our perspective, from IBW Nika's perspective, it really starts with the training. I've heard about automated, automated demand response. We added that training module into our apprenticeship program in the fifth year this semester. So getting back to what I shared earlier, when people were talking about, they, could it be done? Could you take 99% of our building stock as existing buildings? So for these energy efficiency systems, we all know we have to reduce our energy, but it have to be installed correctly. They have to work. So one of the first things we did is a new building automation systems lab. So training is so very important, and it continues on. It's advanced lighting controlled, variable frequency drives, the renewable energy piece. Storage is here. Everybody thought solar was going to take. When I got hired, the trustees I work for said, oh, we don't need to do anything with solar. You know, that's, that's not that big of a, oh, really? It's like a cell phone, right? So the same thing's happening with storage. So all of these pieces, we have to train on it because we have to ensure that now wh whoever the owner is, IBW NECA electricians and electrical contractors are gonna go out there and get it installed and it's gonna work the way it was designed. So we are constantly upgrading our curriculum. It's a five-year apprenticeship program, 1,000 hours of classroom instruction where they get college credit, 8,000 hours working in the field and it'll never end for us. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not, but the reality is it never ends for us. So the three-legged stool, you know, how we look at it, here's the three-legged stool. It's energy efficiency, it's renewable energy, and now it's storage in the microgrid. And in San Leandro, where we're located, we're working with the city of San Leandro. They've identified five buildings. We're being one of the five, Kaiser Hospital and three other facilities, where we'll all communicate and talk to each other and work in conjunction so that we can address these issues where all of a sudden, we didn't use any much energy at night. Well, guess what? With electric vehicles charging, we're using a lot more energy at night. So we absolutely need to shift that. And it, for us, it all starts with training a properly skilled workforce to go out and do that work. Andrew, can I make a point on this? This is really important. Yes, um, and we recognize this way back in Sunshot. Um, if you look at it, much of the jobs created, even in solar, 70% of them are in the installation. And at that time, and we put in programs, we spent about $20 million in a single shot to train the trainers. So we had a national grid at the community college level. This is not the Berkeley's or the Stanford's of the world, but it's community colleges. But if you look at it, if you created a cadre, and we were calculating almost 200,000 installers, the equivalent of these would be the diamond roofers, right? When a diamond roofer installs your roof, the state doesn't have to come and do inspection because they're the James Bonds of roofing. Okay? <laughs> they're licensed to roof. So we said, hey. <laughs> In fact, you don't want to come inspect that roof because who knows what will happen, right? <laughs> right, that's right, yeah. Okay, anyway. But uh, we said, hey, how do you get these community college students trained in installing solar panels? And I think it extends to energy efficiency yes. and all of the other things. And these are not things that they have been trained to do. So I think easily this, there could be an order of magnitude more investment in the training part of it. And uh, I applaud Enrica. We work very much with you guys uh, uh, in trying to put these programs together. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I mean, I would point out that there are, you know, the, the DOE, US DOE uh, energy jobs, energy and employment report uh, that used to be an annual thing, uh, and now it's uh, it got zeroed out, but uh, actually the, the it's gone out into the private sector, and the same people are going to do it, but they're not a DOE anymore, um, working with the, Na the NASIO, the National Association of State Energy Officials, actually. So there's an effort to update that report, and, but the last version in 2017 said that there were roughly 300,000, in California, uh, there were roughly 300,000 efficiency-related jobs and about 100,000 solar-related jobs. It's 400,000 good, good yep. jobs that are there. And so they, you know, they need to be trained and they need uh, to do good work yep. so we can keep this virtual cycle going. Um, so I want to uh, open up to audience questions. We got about, I think about 10, Roughly 10 minutes, 12 minutes left. Uh, let's see. How about the lady in the middle right there? And then we'll go to uh, for our for our panelists, please. <laughs> oh, actually, my question was for you. Uh -oh. Wondering um, what is the CEC's role in setting up standards and pushing the building envelope envelope? Mm -hmm. 
Um, you were kind of circling around that question, but um, I didn't really hear an answer. I had a deep energy audit done in mm -hmm. my house, and the builder said he has trouble finding people to do the work, and it's a more low-tech type of job. Yeah. Somebody needs to be able to crawl around underneath, but they need to actually know what they're doing. So what can the CEC do to promote ex the movement of existing buildings envelopes? Yeah, so I'm, I'll try to be quick here. There's a, there's, a, it's a huge, there's a huge answer that I could be giving to that, but uh, we, have, we have a mandate actually to get to our existing buildings. We have a, the AB 758, Nancy Skinner's bill, lives right here in Berkeley. Um, now a senator, uh, she, um, when she was in the assembly, passed a bill that asked us to come up with a plan to uh, get to our existing buildings with energy efficiency. And so we have a plan, and I, I'd recommend you look at it. It's got a lot of good stuff in it. Uh, but you're, work, you're absolutely right on with the workforce issue here. I mean, in, 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 who knew that criteria for hiring in a contractor that does weatherization is get people that are small enough to fit in crawl spaces, right? Uh, I mean, the criteria are not, you know, they're not rocket science. Um, uh, but we need people who are, as you say, trained and, and kind of know something about new technology, but also can get in there efficiently at low cost and do the work. Uh, and I think there's a wide variation in the workforce. Uh, contractors vary tremendously, and, and some kind of um, uh, you know standardization is, is probably a good thing. That costs money. We've been working on this issue for a couple of decades, and I think made quite a bit of progress. But a lot of it boils down to the local government enforcing the code, um, and, and from from you know new construction, but certainly the existing buildings. Every building is different. Uh, and so it does take that touch at the local level. And so we can, you know, we can do all the codes and standards we want. We have the most aggressive codes in the country and maybe the world in terms of the building shell mechanical lighting. Uh, we're about to finish the update for 2020. Um, and we're going to go requ requiring self-generation, you know, solar basically for the first time ever in the code. Um, so we're, we have great codes, um, and I think you know, we, we heard some of that from the panel, but uh, it is about the, what happens on the ground. You know, a lot of it is translating that to reality. We can do all the codes we want, tie them up with a bow, and throw them over the firewall into the world, uh, but the contractor and, and the, the customer have to kind of get it enough to do quality work. And so, uh, so anyway, it, it's a great question and an ongoing challenge, I think, at some, at some level. But we're doing a lot of workforce development, a lot of funding, different initiatives. Um, Let's see. I, I guess so. That was for me. Uh, a second question right here. That's that's uh, no for Dan right here. So in uh, thinking about how we get to 100 percent, if everybody could introduce themselves. Oh, sorry, Dan sorry. Lashoff from yeah. Next Gen Policy. Uh, in thinking about how to get to 100 uh, percent, we're not going to do it entirely on the rooftop. So I'm wondering if the panel has some comments on the on the role, the vision you have of the role of rooftop, community, solar, and other renewables versus utility scale, and how they integrate together. Great, let's see, yeah, go for it, Acord. Well, Dan is exactly right. I mean, we really do need to be pushing on all, all levers, all buttons, if we're really gonna get there. I think the building context is very important, but that's just a piece of it. You know, actually, when you think about it, you know, and it relates to the question just now, what the CEC is doing, you know, we need the whole sector, the, you know, the, the, the industry, uh, we need our, the policymakers, the regulators, all pushing the same direction if we want to get anywhere near 100% renewable energy. And I know that's obvious to this group, but I mean, there's, you know, it's not only here in California, but it's, uh, it's also back in Washington. I mean, we, we've been working very closely in trying to push uh, FERC uh, on establishing a mark, you know, adhering to market-based principles, enabling renewables to more ably com compete in our power markets. Uh, we, you know, we just had a, a proposal that came from DOE to provide uh, out-of-market subsidies to coal and nuclear uh, under the no guidance, uh, the notion of resilience. That was shot down by FERC, but there's still an ongoing challenge to get them to be pushing the same direction to allow renewables to compete in our power markets. And I think on the, the, uh, the tax side, if you look at what's going on in Washington on that front, um, we, uh, we, we dodged a huge bullet in tax reform this past year. There were some proposals to undermine our tax credits, but the tax credits for renewable energy are set to you know, phase down and out while the incentives for uh, conventional sources of energy uh, remain permanent and deep in the code. So we've got some big challenges there on that front, not to mention you know, the trade, the solar trade case, which would, you know, increase the, the cost of solar panels, at least in the near term. But I think we probably overcome that. And uh, so there, there's, a, you know, a number of, of challenges, and I think we've been making headway. We, we have some bipartisan support in Washington. 
And, you know, interestingly, these proposals that the administration been per, has been pursuing is creating strange bedfellow alliances. You know, we, renewable energy uh, industry, were partnered with API, the oil and gas industry, on the DOE NOPR, so uh, trying to push uh, market efforts. Uh, on the tax side, uh, you know, it's, we, you know we're, we're seeing uh, different alliances also arise on that front. So I, su I do think that the, the work for us is, is huge, and we do need to be having all of these areas kind of push in the same direction. And right now they're not, uh, but this is where we have to, you know, spend a lot of time and effort going forward. How many people here are from outside of the state? Um, I, I've been in uh, some interesting meetings lately where, uh, over the last year or so, where there are actually you know, there are groups of Republicans from red states that are coming together at really pushing clean energy and, uh, and really focused on the policies there. So, um, you know, again, I think they're, they're, there's a broadening consensus about our issue, uh, but it's, um, uh, you know, that highest level is kind of, you know, not necessarily pushing Just, in, just in to eliminate favor. that point on the, on the tax bill this past year, it was uh, Republicans from, uh, you know, really wind states yeah. and, and a couple, Dean Heller from Nevada standing yeah. up and making sure that renewables were, yeah, exactly. you know. Yeah. So I think we have that right, uh, question right there. Yes, go ahead. Yes, um, I'm Sarah Golden from Cater Communications. And I was struck by your opening comments, Commissioner McAllister, about the idea of zero net energy not being enough alone and that we really need to get to zero carbon buildings. And of course, a big, role of that deep decarbonization is addressing how we use natural gas in buildings. Yeah. And I am curious um, what Byron Benton was, thinks about how uh, IBEW is approaching the push to electrify different appliances within buildings and get to electrification of buildings, and whether there are things that could be happening that would help um, IBEW further support and promote electrification of buildings. Well, I speak for Alameda County. It's interesting because <laughs> you're asking, right now we have a conference in Washington, D.C. So on the East Coast, I'm back, we're gonna be in Pits Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania next week, and I was warned, Byron, that's coal country when you get back there. We use no natural gas at the z &E Center. So, you know, what we're looking at in California is, you know, what we've been talking about all along. It's full speed ahead as far as, you know, what we're doing with the city, so again, we, we've gotten to finally to the third piece, which is really now the microgrid and storage. And so more and more people are getting on board. So what, from our perspective, we just need to properly train on it to make sure now that these systems are installed and they work right the first time. I, I hope I answered your question. I just wanted to add really super quick. We're I was talking about a gentleman who's, who's talking about our building in Washington, D.C. on Saturday. And he shared with me, his name's Tim Spina, who goes, Byron, in the end, they say, no one gets behind your product or your vision unless they know the why. And so I hope we just keep doing what we're doing here and letting people know about the why. Because our younger generation, my children, they know in the end, this is creating a healthier environment for them while it's also providing living wage jobs for our local citizens. And that's the win-win, and that's the why. And we're doing the right thing, and that's why I believe we'll persevere. That's Thank great. you. So if I have time for one more question, uh, I want to make one quick comment. So Vijan, you can come right after me, but uh, I want to I want to just uh, point out we have a cultural issue to overcome here because uh, we have everybody from just average you know average people using their their gas ranges all the way up to powerful legislators who are are cooks, uh, you know, serious cooks. Uh, can't get their heads around induction cooking. And uh, that, if, if we are forced to install gas because people want gas ranges, then that, that's a difficult barrier. So, and you know, I don't think that's something we're gonna mandate from you know, legislation or something, that people can't have their, their, their gas ranges. So um, there's, a, there's a comfort level. I think we need to do a lot of selling and marketing out there for the end use technologies, and they have to be ready for prime time. They just have to be voluntarily you know, uh, enabled in the market. And so, Vijay. Yeah, um, it's John White from CERN. I just wanted to make a comment about the, uh, the need to transition from simply deploying these technologies to counting the value they create when we're doing reliability. We haven't yet crossed the threshold at the PUC where demand response is seen as a valuable resource that should be paid for substituting for gas. The ISO has 
sometimes of two minds, but I think the key is we're going to have to establish the ability to do reliability with solar batteries, demand response portfolios of resources that to together mm -hmm. can provide the, the, the services the system needs and get paid for it. But we haven't got there yet with the regulators, despite the rhetoric. People are talking about deploying, but they're not talking about counting and people getting paid. Uh, is there a question in there? No. <laughs> Absolutely. I, 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 I think we've heard you. Well, go ahead. Uh, we'll, we'll get one comment in on that. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, it's, I think that's the case uh, across the country, too, John, I would, I would add, and, 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 and including at FERC very much. Uh, I would just note, note the, like, the, uh, the storage decision that came out of FERC uh, just a few weeks ago, or finally, finally is putting storage, you know, on the same plane as other resources in the market, so sending the signal to the RTOs that they've got to accommodate storage, provide the value that it offers in, in tariffs and in, in, in market design. So I think that's, that's an important initial step, even by this new FERC, with a 5-0 decision. We had a 5-0 decision in January on the DOE NOPER to kill it, and, but move forward. There's still some issues that hang out there. But I actually think that uh, you know, this is where I think the battle is going to be waged. And it's not just an, uh, even, it's even on the building's front. It's, it's actually the broader uh, market signals in our power markets that are going to determine whether we get to a renewable energy future or not. It's not so much the technologies they were, they're actually cost competitive and cost advantaged. The cheaper source of new power in the country is wind by far. Solar is right there. It's cheaper than coal, cheaper than gas, by far cheaper than nuclear. So it's not an economic issue. It's, it's actually a regulatory price formation signal, uh, power market design issue uh, you know, that is really going to determine whether we get there or not. So as much as, uh, you know, some industry people, business people, and, and scientists are really moving forward on these technologies, it's really about policy. It's about the frameworks for these markets that are going to determine this kind of future because these technologies work, and again, like I said, they're cost advantage. You guys have proven it here in California. Companies like uh, that are corporates that are incorporating more and more. They want to do more, but they're, they're, they're dealing with a policy market framework that in a lot of cases does limit. So anyway, I would just reinforce that point that that's really where uh, you know, the battle lies to get to a renewable energy 100% future. Great, well let's give our panelists a big hand.